Inside Out 2 is the latest film from Pixar. They've been having a rough go of it the last few years, and there was a pretty infamous article released in Bloomberg where Pete Docter, a director at the company, was talking about their frustrations. It's no secret that movie theaters have been struggling recently, pretty much ever since the pandemic. Among other factors like the economy keeping people less willing to go out to the theater and spend all that money, along with streaming services taking away attention from theaters, it's often the case that movies released in theaters will be on streaming within a matter of weeks. All of these, plus some other factors, have contributed to a decline in movie-going audiences. Then companies themselves have been facing their own issues, including Pixar. Originally, Pixar was known as a studio that could pretty much do no wrong. They had hit after hit after hit, but we've seen them falter in recent years, including having major flops like Lightyear. And audiences have seen them more as just milking their old franchises rather than really innovating the way they used to, something that Doctor pretty much confirmed, and stated that Disney is planning on continuing down that direction, which is pretty concerning. Many of Pixar's recent offerings have been a more personal story, based on their director's life experiences, like Luca being based off of its director's childhood in Italy, or Turning Red's story about the director's experiences going through puberty and with her mother. Although Disney made the decision to put these movies directly on streaming, largely due to factors like the pandemic, so I don't think it's really fair to compare them to other movies that Pixar has released, and ones that actually were able to come out in theaters. Like, I think Lightyear would be a better example of them faltering at the box office, for example. But now they're saying that they only want to release sequels and movies that have a general appeal, instead of ones that are more personal stories. And listing Inside Out 2 and Moana 2 as examples, both of which are sequels. I talked in my last video about how Disney has been overcompensating lately, this time allegedly canceling Tinkerbell from her meet and greets because she's seen as problematic, due to the character's anger management problems and body issues. So they've been going out of their way to play things safer, like not including a love interest, something we haven't seen since 2013's Frozen, or having their lead characters fit a similar adorkable personality, and their latest animated feature flopped at the box office, despite the fact that this probably should have been an easy slam dunk for them. First of all, it was the company's centennial anniversary, which should have given them a lot of press, and the movie's concepts seemed to have really resonated with a lot of people. However, they ended up deciding to play it safe. Star went from being a shape-shifting magic boy who was also implied to be the love interest for Asha, to this cutesy, marketable Luma knockoff. And Asha herself is probably one of the worst offenders when it comes to being overly adorkable. Frankly, the whole thing reeks of corporate meddling. And I sincerely hope that Disney was able to learn some lessons from this movie. I do worry that Disney is more concerned with optics and virtue signaling than they are with making quality movies and other content. They just got caught in a scandal thanks to Project Veritas, where the vice president admitted that they refused to hire or promote white people, men in particular, even going as far as not hiring a mixed race person because he didn't look black enough, so they're pretty much more concerned with photo ops than they are with hiring creative people who would fit that job description, which goes against their own stated company business and ethics standards. Again, they seem more concerned with their optics, even if it goes against the company's actual policy, which they can get sued for. So it'd be interesting to see how this ends up getting handled. And I honestly think the company is suffering because of this overcompensation, both on screen and off screen. Meanwhile, at Pixar, they released Inside Out 2 a couple of weeks ago, a sequel to the original that came out in 2015. And although it has been a while, it's not the longest we've waited for a Disney Pixar sequel, like The Incredibles or Finding Nemo. Inside Out 2 ended up doing very well at the box office, and it looked like the W that Pixar really needed. But admittedly, I was more curious about the second weekend and see if the drop would be a significant change from the first weekend. But Inside Out 2 still went really strong, managing to break 100 million in its second weekend, making it the highest grossing film of the year, and I wouldn't be surprised if it kept that title. But did Inside Out 2 really do so well just because it's a sequel? Or because it branches away from a more personalized story? Does it really end up proving what Doctor was saying to be true? Or could it be something deeper than that? Because I personally think the latter is the case. First of all, and perhaps a bit ironically, Inside Out 2 is also a personal story. Based on the director's experiences with their own children, I really don't think it's autobiographical stories that's the problem. I mean, those movies did come out during the pandemic, and being dumped directly onto streaming was not exactly helping them. And then there was Lightyear, which was just kind of boring, no offense. 
I think that a spin-off featuring Buzz Lightyear could have been really cool, but it probably would have done better if they had actually played off the lore from the Toy Story movies, because this was quite the departure. I think Inside Out 2 did a really good job at feeling natural and not like just a cash grab. It feels like it's just continuing from the last movie. Riley is now 13 and experiencing puberty, and the film tackles the mental and emotional aspect to that time period. One thing I really liked about this film is that Riley felt more like her own character. In the first movie, it felt more like the emotions were the ones who were completely in control, and Riley herself didn't have much say in what was going on. But in this film, there are parts where the emotions step back and just let Riley do things on her own, which helped make her feel like her own person. She ends up getting new emotions, all of which are still negative, leaving joy as still the only positive emotion, which in my opinion is not a good thing, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, these include anxiety, envy, ennui, and embarrassment. I think these emotions do make sense for a teenager. However, ennui and Envy did feel pretty superfluous. It would have been nice if they had given them more to do. While Joy has been known to be a control freak, Anxiety soon takes over, who is an even bigger control freak, and ends up bottling up the original emotions and sending them away, so that way she can have total control of the command center. Now, like in the first movie, the emotions need to travel across Riley's mindscape, which might sound like they're just rehashing the plot of the original, but they found ways to be innovative with it. Like this time, disgust, anger, and fear are joining them, which helps flesh out the three of them. Meanwhile, Sadness is sent back to headquarters to be their anchor, which mixes up the dynamics in interesting ways. Personally, I think the biggest strength of the movie is how visually striking it is. There are a lot of really creative elements to this film that do an interesting and fascinating job at depicting these abstract concepts. Things like Riley's sense of self being molded by her experiences, shown as these strings that all lead to her core beliefs. And the rest of her mindscape is very well defined. The sarcasm was a really funny joke, too. I do wish that they had been able to tie the other emotions in a little more naturally, since in the first movie they were completely absent from the parents' brains even though they were fully developed. They end up throwing them in at the very end as a joke, but that just begs the question why aren't they at the control panel like the rest of the emotions? It's pretty obvious that they weren't actually considered when making the first movie, but that was really my only issue here. In the end, this film has a lot of heart. And it doesn't just feel like a lazy cash grab, which unfortunately has felt like the case with some of these Pixar sequels. And what I'm personally very concerned about with Doctor's comments. Despite Inside Out 2 being a more personal film, it is very relatable just to general audiences, so I think it was able to capture that balance really well. Riley's biggest concern in the movie is fitting in, something that anyone can relate to, whether they're young and in that age range, or whether they're older and thinking back to their own high school experiences. The film is very very layered, and I honestly hope that Pixar is able to recognize this. I think that Inside Out 2 proves that Pixar does still have that storytelling magic. They just need to remember to put the story first. And I think the same is true for Disney as well. But they need to not worry so much about sanitizing things or fixing things, and just focus on telling a really good story, whether it's more for general audiences or based off of people's personal experiences. Just don't run Inside Out into the ground, please. But that's my opinion. What do you guys think? Did you enjoy Inside Out 2? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching everyone. I really appreciate it. Before I go, I want to give a shout out to our members. Tyrant Carnivore, Shiny Orc Boy, General Bolivar, Depth Charge Media, Samaru163, Gabby Hime, Verdant Range, JVR, Phil C, Taylor Ramirez, Equestron, Norman Sweetcream, Way Beyond Coincidence, Hunter Rose, 80s Nostalgia Guy, Felix Bam, Lucas Geist, J Draws, Meowzers, Sky, Jinke Z, Philip, Isaac Martinez, Garcia XV Legend, Tobias Weller, Bandito Bane, Mac B909, Crimson Phantom, Dakari the Professor, Lil, Data Dine Executive, Owen Wildish, and Jin the Goblin. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to become a member, you can hit the join button next to the subscribe button. We also have buy me coffee if you want to support us that way. If you enjoyed the video, you can leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content. And that part's free. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.